for? Or the majority of people ask for? Are we going? Yep. And so we named it the holographic sex, spiritual holographic sex and the esoteric feminine mystique. Which is of course based upon the fact that everything in the physical is holographically a replication of what's in the mind and the spirit and the cosmos and the pattern of God. So if sex is in the physical, then it has its equivalent on all levels of being. The holographic divine pattern. Everything that exists in the physical is an allegorical shadow image of higher mind and spirit which means that the purpose of sex is not necessarily procreation like the Catholic Church promotes but actually procreation is more or less an allegorical symbol of a higher reality and of course the holographic divine pattern means that whatever exists in the ma macrocosm is replicated into each of its parts expressed in Genesis and the reality that man was created in the image and likeness of God. Now, of course, as the understanding of God progresses, so does the understanding of self. God is not a little old man with a beard sitting someplace. God is great and expansive, and all that exists exists within the mind of God, which is why in that Delphic Oracle it says all the treasures of creation exist within each of us. The Logos, or Son of God, is the third force balance, or offspring of Mother, Father, God. And the Logos then is what's known as the mind of God. Same as our mind is the result of the physical and spiritual en energies within us, so is the Logos. So what Jesus accomplished was becoming at one with the Logos. He was not the Logos because the mind of God is all things. The coming kingdom. While the historian has long acknowledged that the dogma of the church has virtually nothing in common with the original teachings of Jesus, which was known as the number way, a number of remnants exist which confirm this fact. Now we're going back now to first century, where this it's called the second epistle of Clement. It states let us expect, therefore, hour by hour, the kingdom of God and love and righteousness. What that means is that they're expecting the kingdom to come any minute, any time, just like is written in the epistles of Paul. Since we know not the day of the appearing of God, for the Lord himself, upon being asked by one when his kingdom would come, replied, When the two shall be one, that which is without as that which is within, and the male and the female, neither male nor female. What that demonstrates is that there's no kingdom coming upon the earth as Jews, Christians, New Age, and everybody else is trying to predict, because it can only come within you. It already exists. That's, I use this one here because this, is, this, is a, this has been preserved in the history, in the church history since the first century. But what it opens is the reunion of opposites, which is what it uh, is portraying. Jesus said the kingdom will come when two shall be one. That which is without is that which is within, and the male with the female, neither male nor female. Which confirms that Jesus taught that the kingdom will never come upon the earth as man looks for it, because it's within us. We happen to be in what's called the outer darkness, and we don't see it. We don't can't sense it until we transform ourselves. Parallel teaching in the Gospel of, Thomas go, com, Gospel of Thomas goes one step further. When you make the two one, and you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, and when you make the male and female one and the same, so that the male not be male, nor the female female, then you will enter the kingdom. Period. And that doesn't matter whether you're a man or a woman or, or what, anything else until you bring that oneness within yourself. 
you cannot enter the kingdom. We must first understand what divided opposites are portrayed and that we must understand how to reunite them. Gospel of the Nazarenes. I bring this up because this preserves an important concept of the same exact teaching that the others are missing. Now there was always different versions of everything written by different, different people, different scriptures, different what, so that it's, it doesn't mean that the others are wrong, it just means this one gives us an insight into something that the others don't, even though it's the same teaching. I'm going to focus on one thing. And one said to him, Teacher, when shall the kingdom come? Which is the same question. When shall the kingdom come? And he answered and said, When that which is without shall be as that which is within, and that which, which is within shall be as that which is without, and the male with the female, neither male nor female, but the two in one. They who have ears to hear, let them hear. And then it has a second version a couple of chapters down and this one's even more important and one of his disciples asked him how shall a man enter into the kingdom isn't that what mankind is trying to do find the kingdom and find the truth that's what the prodigal son is here he just doesn't understand it when he's lost in this world and he answered and said if you don't make the below as the above and the left as the right and the behind is the before, entering into the center. And that word center is very important. And passing into the spirit, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And that's the reason, because of that center, is the reason I'm using that version out of the Gospel of the Nazarenes in addition to the original Epistle of Clement and the Gospel of Thomas. The second version poses the question, how a man is to enter the kingdom? In other words, the kingdom is something that we have to enter. Not that so much comes to us or comes upon the world, but something that we should strive to enter. Thus we must enter through the narrow gate, which is the making reference in the Gospel statement of Matthew. And this, this is important because the Gospel of Matthew states, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go in by it, because narrow is the gate and difficult is the way that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Not exactly say your Jesus prayer and you're saved. Entering through the center. The difference is important. Entering into the center and passing into the spirit will not enter the, you will not enter the kingdom of God. What is the center? We must ask ourselves, what is the center? How does one enter through the center? Is this the same as the way of the monk who sits there in meditation and not touching anything, not engaging anything? Is this the same as Eastern paths of meditation where they become fixated upon the sixth spiritual center in the head and they think they're enlightened? The answer is that these religious teachings have virtually nothing in common with the teachings of Jesus on the way. And as much as the Easterners, Theosophy, and the rest of them would like to try to annex the teachings of Jesus on the way, they have nothing in common with them. Neither does the church. And what the reference is being made to here is the tree of life. And this one happens to have the Star of David drawn over the tree of life. The tree of life has 12 spheres. The wisdom, mercy, and intuition is the feminine side. That's the feminine column. The understanding, judgment, and logic is the linear or male column. We see the kingdom of heaven on top. We see the earthly kingdom on the bottom. And we see the center. And actually, everything's got to come in. When they say, when the gospel says love is the answer, because everything, all those outer spheres have to come into that center, that love sphere. Below it is the foundation sphere, which is, connects with your soul and which is all, connects with all your previous lives, all that you've ever, all that your soul has ever lived. Above that is the knowledge sphere, and that has nothing to do with the knowledge of this world. That's where Gnosis comes from, divine manna from the kingdom. The intellect sphere is not intellect as we would think of it. 
The intellect is how you utilize your knowledge in the life you're living. After all, rhetoric is meaningless. And that's the 12 spheres of the tree of life. Why I overlay the Star of David over is because that shows completion and perfection of the tree of life. Impressions as food. What is impressions? These are your thoughts. Now what, what, they say, what they're saying when they say the, fruit, the forbidden fruit of the tree of duality or the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil is actually the separated male and female thoughts and impressions. Because remember, to enter the kingdom, we've got to bring them together and merge them into one. But to grow, you have to have, in the same way that to have an offspring, you have to have the male and female. Mentally, the equivalent of this interaction, male and female, you have to have the interaction of male and female on all levels of being. After all, the Logos is the third force or embodiment of Mother, Father, God in the great mind of God. Impressions act as food for the mind that nourishes and matures the consciousness. Elevated consciousness is necessary to evolve each of the 12 spheres of mind into the tree of life. With respect to the quotations out of the Bible on the tree of life. Let me read what I have. This is taken from one of my websites. And most of these, most of what's presented here is taken right out of the website soulself.org. It's just a shortened and intensive vision of it. After eating the forbidden fruit of the tree of duality, the statement was made in the allegorical account of Genesis. The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. Everything from that verse on in Genesis up into the book of Revelations is an allegorical portrayal of the building of the tree of life. Of course, they use people, places, situations to portray allegorical. But there is nothing in that that pertains to history, historical persons. Everything is the building of the tree of life from Genesis to Revelation. The next one says, from the Revelation, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Thus, one has to be granted to be nourished by the fruit of the tree of life. Then he showed me a river of the water of life, clear as crystal, coming from the throne of God and of the Lamb. In the middle of its street, on either side of the river, was the tree of life. And this is important, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and for leaves, were the, leaves for the tree were the healing of the nations. And the last one, Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. Again, we have the reference to the gates, entering in through the narrow gate. But Judaism is a mystery religion. They only reveal so much, and unless you join them, and become an initiate, and study with their Jewish teachers, they're never going to give you what you can truly use in its entirety. So the ten sphere tree of life used in Kabbalah really is just like a, an enticing thing they put out there. And most of them don't know it because most of them have borrowed most of their doctrines from the New Age. But the inner core of Kabbalah, the real Kabbalah teaches, understand the twelve sphere tree of life. But they're not going to give the dogs and swine what doesn't belong to dogs and swine. That's why they publish a 10 sphere tree of life, for no other reason. Can I ask you what? You can ask me anything you want. What is the word robe symbolic of? Can you tell me that? In that verse? In the original baptism was a, 
if you look under on the website sacraments.nazarene.org you'll find the where I've been working on the original baptism and the original baptism is a spiritual cleansing spiritual experience and the robe is the wedding garment that each person must put on in order to be invited to the supper of the bridegroom remember whoever did not put on the wedding garment was thrown into the outer darkness that's where we are now but that's not a bad thing because this is the place of growth and development the prodigal son, if the prodigal son didn't venture into the far country then he never would have been able to evolve into a perfected condition a spiritual condition so what's sad so negatively is not necessarily negative it's good to be here this world is good it's exactly it's God's schoolhouse but you have to deal with it in a proper way it's testing it's learning so the the robes is the is the spiritual cleansing and baptism that you receive and it has to you have to have that in an undefiled state in the original teachings of baptism if you sin after being baptized there was no more redemption for you not in that lifetime so this idea that baptism gives insulates you and gives you a license to dwell in sin like it's peddled in the churches that's totally in opposition to what the original church taught and it's easily found on that page sacraments.nazarene.org so the robe that they're talking about the cleansed robe means those who put on this robe of purity spiritual purity and then and seek to enter the kingdom as stated the tree of duality is the male and female separated columns of the tree of life on either side because of the separation of the male and female it also separates the upper and the lower remember the references to make the above like the below and the below like the above but the kingdom of heaven and the earthly kingdom cannot come together in the center so long as the male and female are separated on the vertical columns thus duality is what's being portrayed in the reference to the separation of male and female and the above and the below and the inner and the outer of the gospel of thomas I have here a slide that says the center versus the head. Now most, a lot of these religions place, place great emphasis on the head, including Kabbalah, for that instance. They hold Ketha on their version of the Tree of Life in high esteem. The yogis meditate on the sixth spot chakra, chakra. The monk is there to get spiritual vision and out of denial. And what meditation is, is it's gazing at the light of the soul. But because of the lack of wholeness, you can't become the soul. You just can see the light. It's like looking out a little window, not recognizing. Lots, lo lots of people who meditate believe that what they're looking on is the light of God. They have no conception of their own highest soul self. They've never been there. And they can't be there unless they become whole. Entering into the center is becoming at one with one's higher soul self. Ultimately, after the, for that next stage of birth, you have the same process that goes through with becoming, doing as Jesus did, become at one with the indwelling logos, or mind of God, which is what Jesus attained. The objective of the scriptures is the uniting, reuniting of Adam and Eve within you. After all, if Adam and Eve exists out in the allegorical portrayal of the world, then Adam and Eve also exists within you. And it's the remerger, it brings about the remerger of heaven and earth, permitting entrance into the center. Why the center? Because the center gives you the balance and wholeness. Only when the lower nature is perfected and raised up can the kingdom and everything come into the center. The two columns, upper and lower, inner and outer all comes into the center not the third eye and the head which means that the lower part which is just a feminine reflection of the upper is just as sacred as the as what's in the head which is something that a lot of the Essenes did not understand which is why uh, the disciples of Jesus did not call themselves Essenes 
it was a wholly different philosophy on how to become whole and complete in the teachers of Jesus than what was understood by the Essenes. And definitely not anything in harmony with Eastern religions where their focus on, on the centers and the head has nothing to do with the Catholic Mass or any of the religions around. It's, it's becoming whole and complete. And again, what's said in the Gospel of Thomas, just as to rehash what we've been talking about here, when you make the two one and you make the inside like the outside and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, and when you make the male and the female one and the same, which means Adam and Eve comes back together again. So that the male not be male, nor the female female, then you will enter the kingdom. Which is the reunification of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve is representative of the male and female paradoxical opposite columns of the tree of life. When I say paradoxical, that means they are in opposition, different polarities from different totally opposite sides. The problem is that the tree of life also contains four trinities. So it contains four paradoxical male and female opposites and four third force balances which all have to be brought together and synthesized to become whole. This is a picture that Beth likes that we see the male and female opposites merged into one and that's the fulfillment of what we're trying to, of what spiritual perfection is. A paradoxical opposite are truths which appear to be in opposition but must be resolved in an evolved third force balance of, or offspring. In other words, there remain male and female opposites so long as until they build that third force. And then the third force can be raised up and elevated to a higher plane. For just for an, uh, some information here, I wrote, I copied from the authors of the book Brain Sex, which I'm writing this because it's so contrary to our PC culture of today. And the authors write, men are different from women. They're equal only in their common membership of the same species humankind. To maintain that they are the same in aptitude, skill, or behavior is to build a society based upon a biological lie. And that's what our society is built on. Under the lie of feminism, I quote from the book of Dr. Luanne Brizadine in her book, The Female Mind. And now, doctor, this doctor is a radic was come from the background of being a radical feminist which is what she's talking about here. And after thousands of studies and everything else, she writes, there is no unisex brain. Girls arrive already wired as girls, and boys arrive already wired as boys. Their brains are different by the time they're born. So they merge out of the womb different. And their brains are what drive their impulses, values, and their very reality. I know it's not politically correct. Now she's talking about her background in feminism. To say this, but I've been torn for years between my politics and what science is telling us. I believe women actually perceive the world differently from men. If women attend to those differences, they can make better decisions about how to manage their lives. Women are opposite polarity and they see things opposite to men. But we make them surrogate men in our programming so that they think in a linear fashion. And so doing, we suppress their natural intuitive nature. And if they say, the, the, there's a new type of feminism emerging, they, I think they call it third or fourth school feminism, that the original feminists are trying to disown because they're saying, hey, I'm a woman, I should be different than a man. And the original feminists don't like that. They're trying to make them the same, except for their biological difference of procreation. Equal is not the same. And when I was in spirit 
many, many, many years ago, this was stress to me that I would have to draw upon this and this was important. Equal is not the same. As opposite columns of the tree of duality, when men and women are equal, they are not in any measure the same. Their strengths are in fact in the opposing differences. The strength of a woman is in her differences between that of a man. The strength of a man is in his differences between that of a woman. Modern feminism is based upon a biological lie that is promoted by female misogynists, women that hate to be women, who hate and despise their own femininity. The Bible, when it talks about Eve, it portrays Eve as a helpmeet. But what does that word mean? Diana Webb, in her book, Forgotten Women of God, clarifies this word by explaining. The noun ezer, which is what is drawn from, occurs 21 times in the Hebrew Bible. In eight of the instances, the word means savior. These examples are easy to identify because they are associated with the expressions of deliverance or saving. Elsewhere in the Bible, the root ezer means strength. The word is most frequently used to describe how God is an ezer to man. So, the bottom line is that from the, that gospel perspective, woman is the savior of man. Because woman is an opposite polarity, she's able to complete man, permitting wholeness to manifest and evolve. This also goes for the internal don't have to be married to fulfill the gospel. You, a man who is XY can fulfill it within himself, but it's very difficult. As I said, we were talking yesterday, when you have a wife and you infringe on her feminine thinking, she'll, say, she'll hit you in the head and say, you know, this is the way it is. You can't do that when man, when, when the logic of man suppresses the, his own intuitive nature. We've seen that with the people we've interacted with over the last year, where they were decimating the intuitive nature from a linear perspective. Now, when you're involved in a divine marriage, the feminine or the woman has an equal voice that she can raise and speak back to you. I see things differently. But when you're a singular and living as a monk or a yogi or whatever, that voice is not necessarily there. It's controlled by your ideology, by your thinking and everything else. And it can shut down the intuitive. Woman is, po all right. Woman is polarized negative in the lower nature where man is polarized positive. That's why the majority of women are not prone to the bestiality and the violence that most men are. Woman is therefore able to receive man's vital life force, raise it up within herself and return it back to him at the breasts. Trouble is when she returns it back to him, she returns it back this energy back to him in a form of duality that they must bring together in herself, in themselves. Once we turn, you look at that like I was saying, something strange to you? That there's a higher reason why women have breasts other than nursing? It's because that's where the energy, where a woman is polarized positive and the man is polarized negative, where this circle can come together and return back and forth. That's why men are fixated with women's breasts because that's where their energy life force gets returned back to them. But they don't know it consciously. They just fixated on it. Woman, therefore, is able to return the vital life force raised up at a higher order than what she receives from man. Once returned, the center evolves with the reunion of the male and female columns, permitting the reunification of the heavenly earthly spheres. Heavenly earthly above, male and female left and right. When the male and female can come together, then the earthly and the heavenly can come together in the center exactly like it states in the Gospel of Thomas. Here we see again the four trinities. Now this is where it gets a little touchy. You're not actually using these spheres, these 12 spheres of mind, 
when you're in an organic condition. Within each of these spheres, because the holograph graphic pattern is replicated in each part, the holographic pattern is also replicated in each one of these spheres. So there's, we call it the 12 and the 12. So the earthly sphere down here is actually has 12 earthly trees of, or a tree, tree of life within itself. And what happens in a carnal mind is when the energy rises, it only touches the earthly coming up through the tree of life through the rest of the body and the mind. Thus, the person remains carnal, organic in their thinking. The spheres themselves never develop beyond the earthly limitation. And this is important. This is caused because each one of these spheres have the pattern replicated into it, and each has a 12 within the 12. And because the thinking of the person remains carnal, they're controlled by their lower nature, the energy coming up only hits the part in each one of these spheres that responds to the earth, never touches the rest of the spheres. Each one of these spheres of mind would have to be developed and transformed and deepened and expanded in order to fulfill the gospel or the realities of life. Everybody understand that concept? It's truly important. Creation of a morphic field. Morphic field is a, is a recently created term that's used to describe what the science has begun to observe in, in uh, physics and whatnot. I'm quoting the book Act of Consciousness and the Awakening Power Within by Amy L. Lansky. And she talks about the work of biologist Rupert Sheldrake. Theory of morphic resonance also depends upon similar, similarly in vibration. Members of the same species being on the same wavelength are able to tap into information that pertains uniquely to them. Yesterday in the presentation of Dave and Reba, we were talking about the vibration of people and the attachments and whatnot and how these essential oils can soak in to the vibration and alter the vibration of the people. What it's saying here is man has a commonality called Jung's collective consciousness that so there's a morphic field of man, which is different from the morphic field of the animal kingdom, the vegetable kingdom, the angels, God, and everything else. The men, men, similar species, same people, in other words, people are on a, on, a, on a relationship of man. Yesterday we also talked about how there's also race morphic fields, where People are, feel they, 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 black has a different vibration than white, has a different vibration than red, yellow, plus there's the variances in between that manifest a, a vibration more dynamic to all the races. But we talked about the preserving of the red race and that it had to be preserved in order for this country to evolve. That's because the red race has its own morphic field in addition to the human morphic field, as does the white race, as does the black race, as does all the variations of man. Um, I have a question about that, including race. It also goes down to other subsets that kind of make up your vibration, right? So your ethnicity, or whatever that word is. Yes, that can, yes, I would say yes. The geographic area you live in. Yes, most definitely. Your family unit, the school you went to, right? So yes. all those are like layers all of that. things that Women have their own morphic field that they indulge in, right. different than what male access. And all these are sub-morphic fields. Yeah. But the big one is that when husband and wife intentionally create this morphic field. Okay. And here he mentions such members as the same family of loving couples resonate in more focused zones of vibration, which is what he portrays. They have access to their own private frequency. So a husband and wife has their own morphic field 
that they create within themselves. The rest is basically. Because in men and women are paradoxical opposite polarities, they have the potential to be reunited as one flesh. But we talk about one flesh, yet we see them separately. That's because the one flesh is making reference to the morphic field that they create. And this becomes to them an atmosphere, almost being immersed in this morphic field of the marriage that they create. And even when they're separated, they can still be together and they can breathe in, breathe in the essence of the, their partner in a divine marriage. To accomplish this, the man and woman must enter into a divine marriage, totally completing each other, building the third force offspring manifest in mind and spirit. So they can dwell in the world, in their own little world, and be separate from the rest of the people of the world. As men and women, they have that power. And that is far more intense than these nature morphic fields that exist. Therefore, divine marriage has virtually nothing in common with the civil unions ordained by man today. Which is why I wrote that blog article, they should make all of the institutions of man civil unions, because that's what they are. They have nothing to do with the sacrament of marriage. To understand duality, you must understand the trinity. So if we see here male and female on the horizontal on the same plane, initially in a physical marriage, the third force is down there on the same horizontal in the middle. As the marriage evolves, it grows and it transforms the people themselves to where the consciousness of this morphic field they create is at a higher level, another plane a spiritual plane, which that gives them access in order to reach. This has nothing to do with the unions like of this world, which they call marriages. And it elevates the, that having access to that third force, which they built within their marriage, gives them access into their soul cells, into spirit, and ultimately into the logos. A civil union. The marriages of man ordained by the institutions of man are representative of state licensed sex and cohabitation. Nothing more. There are people who take these relationships and build upon them. They build lasting relationships. But man cannot make the two one flesh. Only they can make the two one flesh in conjunction with being ordained by God. As I write, these civil unions which man portrays as marriage exist on a horizontal plane, flat and earthbound. What they do with them is what creates the marriage. While these marriages can be binding and good, they have little in common with the spiritual sacrament of marriage that makes the man and woman one flesh, enabling them to bring about the next stage of birth and entrance into the kingdom. When Jesus said you must receive the kingdom as a little child because you must go through the next stage of birth and become a child in the kingdom, when you go through the process of birth, you become a child, do you not? That's the, what the, to baptize young children, that's total misunderstanding of what the gospel is trying to say. A spiritual marriage has requirements. You can't define, the same way you can't redefine marriage, which means that the, but the Supreme Court is a bunch of asses to think they can. Neither can people redefine marriage. Because the same way as gnosis cannot be in a book, gnosis cannot be taught by other men, I cannot teach you gnosis, only the indwelling logos can teach, can convey to you gnosis. Different than not what we call typical knowledge. Man cannot create marriage, only by living by the institutions set forth in spirit by God can a marriage exist. Therefore, spiritual sex is a sacrament that can only be celebrated by a husband and wife who have transformed the physical bodies into the living divine temple. Premarital sex defiles the body temple, which is why it's condemned in the scriptures. Adultery negates a spiritual marriage. 
absolute fidelity must be manifest in a spiritually ordained marriage. These are some of the requirements. Sex as a catalyst. That's a new terminology. The exchange of bodily fluids and sex permanently connects the man and woman on an etheric level of mind and with vital life force. A man who has many sexual partners has many dependents that bleed off his vital life force. He stays connected to them thereby grounding him to the earthly carnal portrayed in the parable of the product son as riotous living. A woman who has had many sexual partners cannot complete a husband. And like the woman at the well, has too many studio husbands to have a husband. Remember, when she said, give me the life-giving water to drink, she said, well, go, Jesus said to her, well, go get your husband. She couldn't have a husband because she had five of pseudo husbands. These were the five men that she was connected to. While the loss of vital life force can be lessened, it cannot be totally negated. The woman at the well had no real husband because of her attachment to five other men. While Jesus, while Jesus pertained to the woman caught in adultery that he who was without sin let him cast the first stone, he also told the woman, go and sin no more. What he was saying was, you made your bed, now lie in it and deal with it and go and do it no more. That's an old saying back from the ancients, you made your bed, now lie in it. They don't use that anymore. There is no standards anymore. Recreational sex. Our culture has institutionalized recreational sex. This grounds the people to their carnal appetites. While sex is not a sin, so long as it is not coerced, the defilement of the body will inhibit the seekers from entering into a divine marriage and the evolving unions into a living temple where wholeness can be achieved and manifest. While spiritually advanced men and women can with struggle overcome the effects of a defiled body, which means many of the people here who are more advanced than the others who have never sought light and truth can deal with this to a certain extent, but the conditions will be a struggle. And their advancement will be inhibited. How far inhibited depends upon the circumstances of each union, each person. From this I took directly from the perspective of a mystic from a few from off the website soulself.org, which I had listed, but it was interesting, especially Samuel, uh, was it Samuel on or is that you say it properly? On his Gnostic teachings, and he defines what adult, uh, about adultery. And he writes, since a woman's body is a passive and receptive element, it is clear that her body collects and stores more of the results of the sexual acts than all of the men who commit adultery with her. Those results are atomic substances from the men with whom she has had sexual intercourse. Therefore, when someone has sexual intercourse with a person who has been with other partner or the other partners, both of them absorb the atomic essences of the other partners and poison themselves with them. This is a very grave problem for those brothers and sisters who are dissolving the lesser eye or the, because then not only do they have to fight against their own errors and defects, but more, they have to fight against the errors and defects of those whose other partners whom they have had sexual intercourse with, and that's true. And this is why I only quote these people because these are other voices other than mine which basically is saying the same thing. And this is why the scriptures state, and the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall have should be put to death. It isn't that they should be put to death, but they are killing themselves spiritually. They're bringing themselves into the... Remember, Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. So the masses, he portrays as being spiritually dead. That's why Jesus did not throw the first stone, but he said, go and sin no more. Three evil deeds that create suffering. This is from the Buddha. Depending upon the body are killing, stealing, and committing adultery. 
Why would the Buddha see committing adultery as a sin or as an evil deed? And again, from the Leviticus, adultery can be committed with the eyes, which is important. Commit no adultery. This law is broken by even looking at the wife of another with lustful mind, the Buddha. You have heard that it was said by them of old time, this of course is the gospel, thou shalt not commit adultery, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Thus, adultery is also a thing of the mind that can negate a marriage and defile a marriage. Visual exchange of vital life force. The mystics note that adultery begins in the mind because a man who looks upon another woman with lust loses vital life force. He expels it. The woman attracts it. A woman who flaunts her sexuality loses the vital life force imparted to her into nature. This is why the scriptures say you have to have a, a pure wife, a good wife, because if she's defiled, she loses that vital life force into nature and no true growth can take place. Thus the words of Jesus in the Gospel, but I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman with lust after hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. No true spiritual marriage can exist regardless of the ordination of man. No priest, no rabbi, no anything can create a marriage, only what's in the people's heart. And the law of grace can be invoked depending upon what's in a person's heart. We enter into these lives, into the present situation to deal with these lives and to become stronger. So sometimes the events of life, by overcoming them, make us stronger. So everything isn't all doom and gloom. I see positive in everything. That's why I'm difficult to deal with. Sex is not a sin. That I was told directly in spirit when I began developing. Sex is not a sin. The Bible is designed for seekers and not the people of the nations who have no part in the community of spiritual Israel. So what's written in the Bible is not for man to abide by. When it says sex is a sin, it's not dealing with nature man. It's dealing with those who are like yourself, striving to become spiritual Israel. Allegorically, the Jews are one-twelfth of Israel and are allegorically portrayed as those who have received the law of God but observe it externally in ritual and tradition. This is why the Jews oppose Jesus. Because Jesus said this is, should be turned within self and brought the law should be fulfilled within yourself, not outwardly in ritual or tradition. Spiritual Israel are those who have developed and matured the 12 spheres of mind of the tree of life. After all, the 12 tribes do not exist outside. The 12 tribes exist within yourself. And the tribes themselves must become singular and become disciples, just like in the Gospel. So the Gospel, of course, is the fulfillment of the law. The requirements are not the same. And this is important because we can be obstructed by our own judgments of ignorance. The requirements for the Jews is not the same as spiritual Israel as portrayed in the Gospels. The requirements set forth in the law of Moses for the Jews is not the same as that for the people of the nations. Sex is not a sin so long as it is not coerced. Neither is same-sex relationships a sin. All forms of sex outside of a spiritual marriage is merely variations of mutual masturbation and nothing more. All marriages ordained by man are civil unions because man does not have the power to create a marriage, ordain a marriage. Only God does and there's requirements. The requirements and prohibitions set forth in the Bible is not intended for nature organic man. So when the Christians say that the Bible says that you shouldn't have this relationship or that relationship, they're applying it to people who it's not meant for. And since Christians aren't really seekers, it really doesn't apply to them either. 
spiritual marriage, sex outside of marriage is a sin for spiritual Israel because of the defilement of the body temple. A true marriage is contingent upon the contents of the heart and the mind. A true spiritual marriage requires absolute fidelity on the part of the husband and wife. A true marriage fulfills the requirements set forth in the Gospel of Thomas. So let's do for another reminder. I like these reminders. When you make the two one, and when you make the inside like the outside, and the outside like the inside, and the above like the below, when you make the male and female one and the same in that etheric body that surrounds them in their own atmosphere. So that the male not be male, nor the female female, then you will enter the kingdom. And where will you enter it? Through the balance center, not through the head, not through the genitals, not do anything but the center, when all is brought together in harmony and oneness and wholeness. And they have a graphic sex as a spiritual sacrament. Spiritual communities. Genuine spiritual communities must seek to fulfill the gospel adage of dwelling in the world and not of it, which by the way, is the meaning of the poor ones. Ebonite is not a group or a sect or a religion. It's a condition of mind, being poor to the ways of this world. By providing the necessary environment for genuine spiritual seekers, more advanced souls can be born into their number. You want to create an environment where of anointed souls, then you have to create that community. You have to do the work. This is important. By working to create proper spiritual environments for more advanced souls to be born into, you will inherit the necessary grace that permits you to be born into a future spiritual environments and communities. So what you do now, you're orchestrating your future. Doing the necessary work to create a community environments for others, you will open the door to achieving the next stage of soul birth in the future. By working to create a true spiritual marriage, you will be born into the conditions where you can fully manifest your spiritual marriage in the future. You are presently creating your future, right now. You're, as if your future is a picture that you're drawing with what you're doing right now in your words, thoughts, desires, and deeds. A spiritual environment. When a man creates an environment where a woman, and a special wife, can arise to her full potential, the environment itself will permit him to arise to his own true potential. Now what's the potential of a woman? It's not to be a CEO of some corporation, though she can do it, but that's what the people of the world do. Woman has the power of that intuitive, that the man has to work really hard to develop, and it's very difficult. And she can, back in ancient Greece, they had the Sibyl, which was a, vis a woman who was a visionary, could only be fulfilled by one because only woman has this absolute power of the intuitive that can see what most men are blind to. Of course, the man can develop those abilities, but he has to work at it. And even when he works at it, it's still different than that which is, has woman naturally. So when we're talking about potential, we're talking about the potential as a woman, not as a surrogate man. If that's what she wants to be, a surrogate man, then she has the perfect right to do that. She has the perfect right to do anything in her life she wants to. They portray them as people of the nations, the dead, and whatnot. Man is imbued with greater strength and power, and as man does to woman, the same is returned to him. I look upon the Islamic countries keeping women in burqas and keeping them down and doing all they do to the women. That's why the men are so dumb because they lack that intuitive insight. As woman does to her husband, the same is returned to her. And my last statement here, my wife has invested in me over the course of countless lifetimes spanning thousands of years. This ain't a one-time thing. My wife has been investing her energies into building me up and making me what I am over the course of lifetimes. And while in many lifetimes I achieved what she could not, she has also achieved, come along in certain situations and been able to achieve. And that's how people grow together. 
Now, you can always become a monk, follow a yogi, or whatever you want to do. But this, when you enter into these kind of relationships and you build a spiritual community that manifests these kind of relationships, you invoke the laws of nature to help you. And the laws of nature can supercharge your efforts. A monk cannot supercharge his efforts. The yogi who looks at his third eye and thinks that he's seeing God and doesn't recognize that it's the light of his own soul. He's not supercharging his efforts. Recently, having to deal with the with the uh, New Age and the the Alice Bailey writings, more I come to realize that anybody over there can declare themselves a master, and they get angry at me when I say I'm not the teacher. I'm only here to guide you in the way, because the teacher there's only one teacher. This is beyond their conception. They get mad at you because you don't give out the teachings. That's right. And then, but then they get mad at you for not saying you're not a teacher, but you're a teacher, but they just you won't mad. give us teachings. They're just mad. Now just every, tell us like it is. Now, everybody in this room also has much invested in each other. Because this is not your first time together. You've been together over the course of many lives. Some of us know this for a fact. We can feel it, we can sense it, and some of us can see it. So in the same way that my wife has much time and energy invested in me, people in this room have much time and energy invested in each other, because that community is important. To me, it makes the most sense to understand the laws of nature, invoke them to supercharge your efforts. That means with a whole lot less effort, you can accomplish and prevail. And that's why I know what they don't know. The bottom line is. Because they're going about these roundabout ways to get, to try to get to, it's like those who do violence climbing up the alternative paths. Learn about the laws of nature and about creation and invoke them in your life. That's the easy way to me. Any questions? I think that's, that's the end. Anybody have any questions after that? You wanted esoteric sex, so there it is. It said in the in Genesis uh, when it described the tree of life that the the every month. No, that's revelation. Revelation is in revelation. Yeah. Months are month. months are really the cycles, the twelve within the twelve. The nations are the multitude of fragmented personalities within you. In the same way it exists out in the world, also exists within you. And when you raise up the multitudes of the 144,000 within you, you raise up the whole. When Jesus goes through the cities in the Gospels, the cities are actually the spiritual centers. The trouble is the, the Gospels have been terribly cut down and altered from their original context, and it would be easier to see if they were left in their original condition. But what, he, what was being allegorically played out was his going into each one of these cities and freeing the people from being attached to false religious beliefs, false dogma, man-made concepts, man-made leaders and everything else, and bringing them over into spiritual unity. And that's what's being portrayed in the Gospels, in the preaching to the multitudes, and the changing, the feeding, and the uh, transformation of the multitudes talking about the spiritualization of one's own body. Does that make sense? No other questions? Yes? Well, spiritual baptism to okay. Is it what? Spiritual baptism to okay. Does it always need physical baptism? It's good to have physical baptism. It's good to do in the physical what you're doing in the mind and the spirit. Mm. So would you say then, when one is not physically baptized? I don't make the I you? don't make the rules, Adam. Yeah. You know, no, I, I really don't make the rules. Yeah. So, no, that's what um, there was a life where myself and Flo were born on an island, and we evolved together, community. Mm. So we had we were not exposed to any of the religions of the world, right. or anything any of these teachings. But together, we were able, now, you know, I've been baptized over the course of many lives. 
So can I renew that baptism? Yes. Can, there was a time where myself, I baptized myself and Flo in our bathtub way back in the beginning, 40 years ago. There's nothing wrong with physical baptism, as long as it's understood that it's a symbol of what must also be done in mind and spirit. I got nothing against rituals. I, I'm terrible influenced because I don't engage in them much, but they're good. I like Tony's prayers <laughs> and everything else. I just don't do things outwardly in ritual and tradition. You want somebody else, not me, if that's what you want. No Gnostic mass here. Any more questions? How about one for Judy? You got one for her? No. Was uh, am I correct on my in on their interpretation of help me? Yeah, I think so. It's not understood. So basically, you're and trying. also the word kinegdo means opposite. Yes. The helper opposite. Well, there was more that I copied him. from, but I only copied a small segment from. But it's all in soulself.org. <laughs> What were you saying, so Tony? you're saying that intellect is basically applied knowledge. Yes. Intellect has, after all, if you possess all the knowledge that there is and you don't apply it properly, then you're very stupid and ignorant. Which is what happens when they do yeah. that in the East. So intellect is not so much a measure of IQ or something like that, but more of to be able to take your knowledge and apply it in your life and use it properly. It goes beyond common sense. Any other questions? That's it. You can shut the recording off. So you're saying then that my another question is then because Jesus attained or Yeshua attained. You understand that the gospels is not about Jesus. No. I Jesus, once it's written in the gospel in the scriptures, Jesus becomes an allegorical image of something within you. But there was a historical man, Jesus. This is what I'm talking about. Go ahead. Okay, would you say then that the Yeshua was selfish because he used all those around him to gain entrance into the kingdom? No. He took advantage of that. He helped them. Right. He raised if them I, am I selfish if I help he you build... Raised them up. Yes. If, am I selfish if I help you build a spiritual community? To raise yourself up. Or well, raise, raise the whole. Raise the whole. But at the same time, you're taking advantage of the laws that when you do this, it actually raises you up with everyone. Else. Yes. We're doing work in the physical and accomplishing things in the physical opens the doors to great opportunity. This is why what they call the epistles of Christ and the revelation where he speaks to the churches and they say these things could never be preached in the churches because what the church preaches has nothing in common with them. The whole focus is on their works. What is works? How they manifest their knowledge. What they accomplish with this knowledge. Because it's what they accomplish that opens the doors each level of time. If you don't reach up and grab the rung and you have to let go of the previous rung, if you don't grab it, you can't climb Jacob's ladder. If you don't do in the physical, it can't manifest. There's also where you, your, your feet are on different rungs too. Philosophy, rhetoric, means nothing. Faith without works is dead. I've heard that before. But, but this is why I was talking about the selfishness. And this is how Jesus, they, the churches take Jesus in. Uh, they see him as a selfish thing, and in turn, they turn it selfishly, that they can use him and blame him for everything that they've done. The more advanced spiritually you are, the more you are obligated to help those who you can bring with you. That's an obligation. And if you don't, then you will yourself be flatlined. And if you put yourself forth, that's something that I knew, of course, but in this life it was especially thrust in me when I did some studying with polarity healing, which is what I was talking with David about. And 
the it was a the man who was teaching the course that I went to was an Orthodox Jew and he was one of the original movers and shakers in the polarity healing environment. And one of the things which he enforced in that class was never take credit for doing a healing because it's a divine force within you that you're just acting as a channel for that energy. And the minute you take um, you say I healed it or I did this and you cancel it all out. The minute you call yourself a teacher, you alienate yourself from the teacher. The minute you say, if you want to come to this little thing we're having here, it's going to cost you this, 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 well, you got your reward. Now, that's not to say that you shouldn't raise money and build something that's good, if that's what the objective is. But anytime you take credit for it, you put an obstacle between you and the source. And since the objective is to connect with the source, call myself a teacher, that would be putting a wall between me and the teacher. Or you lose your freedom. I'm here as a faithful servant, nothing more. If I can answer your question, I'll do so. If you don't like what I say, then don't listen to me. <laughs> That's what free will is. You're going to get to the same destiny eventually. It'll just take longer. That's it, Amos. You're shutting more, it off? Huh? More. There's, uh, one, I think it's one of the African people has a question. What's that? Asking, Are they listening? No, no, no. I just saw it. It's been posted on the forum. The Hi, Alan. I would like to know if the Earth is the only world slash planet. Definitely that not. Developed. I saw that question. Yes, Definitely sir. not. This is just one realm of development. There are souls that have never even entered into lives like this. They're happy just to remain as they are. And there's different worlds and different universes that work on different things at different times. We're here because we became immersed in this environment and we're using it as a schoolhouse to develop. This is God's schoolhouse. There's many, many schoolhouses.